Okay, this is um, a redo video because the computer program went down on me. So the last topic that we left off of was this problem here, the transforming the graph of a quadratic cupid, cubic square root or absolute value function. And um, I wanted to explain where this information was coming from and then redo this problem. And then I kind of recorded another problem and part of a third problem. So we're going to, and there's another example that I hadn't uh, got to just yet. So before I do that, I need to explain the order of transformations. If you do the transformations out of order, um, it's possible to have your graph end up in the wrong places. So it's very important that you know the order um, that the translations are to be done. And then you also need to know what exactly you're doing to create each of these translations. Now, in all of the problems before this example, before this topic, we've always been moving our points left, right, up, or down, okay? What we haven't discussed is what that is really doing um, is if you're doing a horizontal translation, that means you're moving left or right. And so we were taking the point and we were moving it to the left or we were taking the original point and moving it to the right. That is the same thing as adding or subtracting that number to your X values, right? Because your X values are dictate your position from left to right. Now, um, the other thing that we've been doing is the vertical translation. And so those are when we take the point and we move it um, up or we move it down. And what makes the graph move up or down is the Y value. The Y value dictates the um, up or down location of a point, okay? So I hadn't explicitly stated this, but these are how you do horizontal translations and vertical translations if you weren't given the image and you were just given the points, okay? So this is important because when they tell us to um, move a function around, and, and now I'm adding two more kinds of transformations other than just the translations, um, we need to know what to do, okay? Now the other two kinds of translations that you have are reflections, and that's basically when there's a negative outside of the parent function, then what's gonna happen is it's gonna flip the graph over, and what that means is anything that was up in the top positive y value quadrant is not going to flip over and be in the negatives of the y values. So all we do is change those signs of all the y values and it'll cause that graph to make that um, flipping action occur. Okay. Now the other thing that we have is our stretches and shrinks. Now how do we know whether it's a stretch or a shrink? Okay, the shrink is going to make the graph look wider because things are going to get bigger slower. And that happens when your um, factor or the number that's being multiplied, when the number is less than one. Now the graph will get more narrow because the graph is increasing much, much faster if you're stretching things, okay? And that's when that number is bigger than one, okay? If it's equal to one, then there's no stretching or shrinking going on at all. It's just the same kind of factor. What I mean is if let's say you had the parent function x squared, notice that the coefficient here is just one and there's no stretching or shrinking going on with that. That's gonna look like the exact graph as y equals x squared versus when I have the graph of one half x squared or the graph of two x squared. This one, if you just drew a random graph, right? Let's say that's the parabola for x squared. A number bigger than one is going to make it look wider, okay? And then a number, uh, I'm sorry, a number less than one, one half is less than one, is going to make it look wider. And then when you have a high number, it's going to make it look more narrow, okay? So you can see how that is going to affect it. But how do I do that if I am just given a list of points, right? Well, the way you do that is you take that number, whatever it is, whether it's one half or whether it's two, it doesn't matter. You take that value and you multiply it to all the y values. And so what happens is if I had a point here at 0, 0, and then here at 1, 1, well, guess what? Now that point 0, 0 still stays, but the point at 1, 1 is now at 1, 2, 
is why it, got, it went higher. Here, I would still have the point zero, zero, but now I would have the point one and a half, right? So one to the right and only half a unit up. And so that's how it creates um, whether or not the graph is gonna be wider or narrower, okay? And so that depends on whether it's shrinking. Shrinking makes a wider graph. Stretching makes a more narrow or skinny graph, okay? Um, I use those words a lot. Stretch will make it look skinnier and shrink will make it look fatter. <laughs> um, but it's the same thing as saying stretch will make it narrow and shrink will make it wide, okay? Um, the, I'll just leave it at that. I was gonna bring in an, an analogy, but I won't go there. Um, so let's go back to this problem here. So this problem here was asking us to um, um, it was asking us that below is given the graph of the absolute value of x and it wants us to transform it to make it the graph of y equals negative one half absolute value of x minus three. So I'm gonna go through the four different steps that we've written down and we're gonna do what we need to do to the necessary values. So for the absolute value, I need to have first a list of about five points. So you always have the center zero, zero. And then if I go out one unit, well, what is the absolute value of x? The absolute value of x, or I'm sorry, the absolute value of one is one. So that's this point here. What is the absolute value of negative one? It's also positive one. What's the absolute value of 2? It's 2. And what's the absolute value of negative 2? It's also positive 2. So this is where these values came from. It's just from the typical plugging in negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2 into the parent function. And that's where you'll get um, those values. Okay. Now, um, so what we did first we look to see if we had a horizontal translation. So if you look at this, do you have something being added or subtracted inside the parent function? Now the parent function is the absolute value. So do you have something being added or subtracted to x inside those absolute values? We do not have anything added or subtracted, which is why I cross this out, which means I'm not going to need to do any horizontal translation for this problem. We move on to the stretch or the shrink. Do you have a multiple or a factor outside the trend, the basic, the parent function? Well, look, outside this absolute value, I'm multiplying by one half, which means, remember, for these two, we have to multiply by that factor. So I took each one of these y values and multiplied it by one half. Two times one half is one, did not change the x value. 1 times 1 half is 1 half, did not change the x value. 0 times 1 half is still 0, did not change the x value. 1 times a half is a half, did not change the x value. 2 times a half is 1 and did not change the x value. The only thing we were doing here was manipulating the y values. Now for the third step, so step 2 is done. For the third step, we did the reflection because there is a negative in front of our parent function. So that means that all those y values are now gonna to have to change signs. So notice that none of the x values changed, they're the same x values, but this one became negative one. One half became negative one half. There's no such thing as negative zero, so it stays zero. Negative one half and a negative one. Then finally we went on to the vertical translation. So was there a number being added or subtracted to the outside of the parent function? And there was, we were subtracting three outside. So remember when it's on the inside, you're going to use the opposite um, sign. And when it's on the outside, you're going to use the same sign. So I actually noticed I had an error in my chart here when I was writing this down. So when it's on the outside, it should be the same sign. And when it's on the inside, you should be using the opposite sign, right? Um, we talked about that before. I just had them in the wrong, um, and luckily I didn't do this one, otherwise I would have done the wrong thing. Or I would have caught myself a lot sooner. So let's just carry on. So since this is minus three, 
and it's on the outside, I do that exact same operation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each of these y values and I'm going to minus 3. Now I did choose to use decimals only because I'm going to have to place these on a graph later. And it's hard for me to eyeball where negative um, 7 halves is. I can actually figure out where negative 3 halves is, where 3.5 is. So if I do negative one minus three I get negative four negative one half minus three is negative three point five zero minus three is negative three negative one half again minus three is negative three point five and then negative one minus three is negative four and so all we did was take each of these five points and plot them on the graph and then continue to create that basic shape so um, Let's go ahead and try that to another example, okay? So we have here, now we're given the graph of x squared and we want to transform it to this function, okay? So going through those same four steps. So step one is to see if we have a horizontal translation where there's a number added or subtracted to x inside the parent function. My parent function is a square and inside the square, I am adding three to x. So what that means is I need to do that opposite operation to all the x values. So I took each of the original x values and I subtracted 3. Now, where did I get those values in red, right? Remember, I said you plug negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2 into the parent function and you'll get the set of original points that you're going to start transforming, okay? So negative 2 squared is a positive 4, negative 1 squared is a positive 1, 0 squared is 0, 1 squared is 1, and 2 squared is 4. So that's where all of the original points in red came from. Now I'm starting my translation. So the first one is the horizontal translation. So because I'm doing plus 3 inside, I'm going to minus 3 from all of my x values. So notice my y values stayed exactly the same. It's only the x values that changed after I subtracted 3 from all of those x values. Now step 2 is the stretching or shrinking. So do I have a number multiplied outside the parent function? I do not have a number. I have a sign, but I don't have a number. The number is just 1. So there's not going to be any stretching or shrinking going on here. So I crossed out step 2. Now step three is the reflecting, and I do have a negative out there, so that means I need to change the signs of all my y values. So notice the x value stayed the same, but the four became negative four. Negative four stayed the same, but the one became negative one. Negative three stayed the same, and you can't have negative zero, so it's still zero. Negative two stayed the same, and one became negative one, Negative 1 stayed the same, and 4 became negative 4. Now we're on to step 3. Step 3, or I'm sorry, step 4. Last step. Now we've got to do the vertical translations. And because we're adding 1 on the outside, that means we need to add 1 to all of our y values to make everything shift up, right? So we're going to have negative 3 here now. We're going to have um, 0. We're going to have 1. We're going to have 0. And we're going to have negative 3. And then once you plot all of those, make sure you keep the same basic shape. You don't want it to look like a V, right? Not the absolute value. It's the square function, so it does still have to look like a parabola. And that's the green graph that you end up with here. So notice it's flipped over. It's shifted to the left three, and it's shifted up one. So it fits all of the criteria that we needed to transform this. Now, this example I left off on my original recording, so we're going to kind of continue from where, where it is. So the first thing I did was pick negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2, and plug each of those values into my parent function, x cubed, the cubic function. So negative 2 cubed is actually negative 8, negative 1 cubed is negative 1, 0 cubed is 0, 1 cubed is 1, and 2 cubed is 8. Now, here I'm going to do my horizontal translations first. So is there a number added or subtracted inside? 
the parentheses there is and it is minus one which means I need to do the opposite operation to all my x values so I added one to all of my x values notice that the y values did not change just the x values got replaced after I added one step two is the shrinking or stretching so am I multiplying by a factor here am I do have a multiple in front of that parentheses and the multiple is a two so what I have to do is multiply each of my y values by two so that means the x value will stay the same this will become negative 16 this will become negative 2 this will become still 0 this will become 2 and this will become negative 8 no I'm sorry negative 16 I gotta multiply it by 2 right then we're gonna do step 3 which is the reflections and I do have a negative which means I need to change all of those y values so that's gonna become positive that's gonna become positive zero a negative is still zero this is going to become negative and this is going to become um oh i don't know why i had it negative there times two is just 16 and then now it's negative here now just fyi you can combine these two steps into one okay because since both of them require you to multiply the y value by something you could instead of having two separate steps you could combine them by just multiplying by that entire thing right so if i were to take from step one and go straight to step three i could all i have to do is take this and multiply it by a negative two and you get positive 16. i can take this number and multiply it by a negative two and i'd get this i could take this um zero multiply it by negative two it would still be zero two times negative two or I'm sorry, 1 times negative 2 is negative 2, and 8 times negative 2 is negative 16. And so you could do both steps, 2 and 3, together, um, or you can do them separately. It's totally up to you. Do you? I like to do them separately because, as you'll notice, once you get more and more examples, sometimes step 2 applies, sometimes step 3 applies, sometimes both of them apply, sometimes only one of them applies, and sometimes neither one of them applies. So I like to keep them separate, okay? Now step four is to do my vertical translations. So do I have any numbers added or subtracted on the outside of the cube? I do not, so I don't need to do step four. What that means is that these are my final points that I have to plot. So when I plot this, um, it's going to be negative 1 and 16, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, it's like way down here somewhere. Then 0 and 2, 1, 2, then 1 and 0, And then 2 and negative 2. Oh, it's positive 16. I should have gone up here somewhere. So like way up there, not down to the negative 16. It's negative 1 and positive 16. So it should have been way up there. Then 0 and 2. Then 1 and 0. Then 2 and negative 2. And then 3 and, neg and negative 16. So that one is down here somewhere. And so now you can see the graph is going to go really way up there and really way down here. Okay. So it does look in some sense a little bit more narrow than the other one. Not too much, but a little bit. Um, and it is reflected over, right? This part is now up there. This part is now down here. And it is shifted over. Notice that the center was over here, but now it's shifted over to the right one unit. Okay, let's continue because we've had an, uh, an example of an absolute value function. We've had an, uh, an example of a squared function. We've had an, uh, which is a quadratic. We had an example of a cubic function. The only one we haven't seen is the square root. Okay, so we need to start off with this one. Now for this one, you cannot start with negative 2, um, 
negative one, the zero, and the one. And why can't you? Because, right, the, um, you can't take, you can't plug this number into the parent function to get the original y value. There's no such thing as a square root of negative two, so you can't do that. You can't plug in negative one. There's no such thing. Well, you, there is a such thing. It's an imaginary number, right? But you don't know about those, so you can't do that yet, okay? You can take the square root of zero, and it's just zero. And you can take the square root of one. It's just one. And since I'm going to have to be taking the square root of numbers, I probably don't want to use two, three, and four as my next numbers. Um, I'm probably going to want to use numbers that I actually know I can take the square root of, right? So... Let's pick um, the next number after one squared is two squared, which is four. So when I take the square root of four, I get two. And then three squared is nine. So when I take the square root of nine, I get three. One, two, three, four. I need one more point. And then four squared is 16. And when I take the square root of 16, I should get four. So these are the five points that I'm gonna start off with here. Not the negative two and the negative one like you're supposed to start off with. And this is only particular to the square root function because you cannot take the square root of a negative x value, okay? But now I'm gonna begin my steps. So here I'm gonna start with, do I have any horizontal translations? I do. I am minusing three inside the square root which means I need to do the opposite operation and add three to each of the x values. So I'm gonna be adding three here, 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 and here. And I'm not gonna do anything to the y values just yet. Okay, now the next step is to do a shrink or a stretch. Now I do have a multiple in there, so I'm gonna multiply each of my y values by two. And there is no negative in the front, so I don't need to do step three. However, I do have a vertical translation, which is the plus one out here. So I'm gonna add one to all of my y values. Okay, now depending on how your graph looks in um, Alex, you may not be able to graph some of these, especially if the little image they give you is like a 10 by 10 graph. Then you won't be able to plot 12, 7, and 9, 19. Okay, so what does it look like in a graph? Okay, um, I didn't want to waste some more camera time because this video is already about 22 and going on 23 minutes. So I went ahead and just drew the graph while the video was paused. And so in the pink is the original values that we had. 0, 0, 1, 1, 4, 2, 9, 3, 16, 4. Okay, so this is the what the apparent function x squared looks like. Now what we have here is you notice that it's a little bit wider than the original graph, right? And, um, or not wider, but narrower. It's growing higher. It's growing up faster, right? This one took a little while to get up there in the y values, whereas this one's shooting up the y values pretty quickly, okay? Um, another thing, so I just graphed 3, 1, I graphed 4, 3, 7, 5, 12, 7, and 19, 9. Now remember, these two you may not be able to graph in Alex, so you may just have to graph these three, and then hit the graphing um, button, and it'll graph that image for you, okay? It all depends on what um, the computer is going to want or how many points the computer is going to want. But I think you're okay with three when it comes to the square root functions. But that's it for transformations and that's actually it for module 24.